I've said this before and I'll say it again. I think original anime series are some of the best experiences to come across in a realm of anime. Much of it is going in 100% blind to the experience. This, I feel, is sort of a missed feeling for anyone who watches an adaptation and caught up on the source material beforehand. To put it simply, it's like beating a puzzle game, then watching your friend play it for the first time, and then seeing them try to wrap their head around what to do. For me, that's an unpleasant experience in the moment for various reasons, and one that I'd rather not have to go through. I'd instead would like to be solving the puzzle with my friend as blind as he is. It's overall something that I think is just a better time playing the game. My experience watching anime adaptations after reading the source material is a major contrast to how my experience has been watching adaptations before reading up on the source material. Going in blind, not knowing where the story would lead, is an enjoyable experience. Original anime is pretty much the same. Now granted, there are a number of series that are sort of the black sheep of original anime, whether or not they ended on a bad note, had a rather flawed storyline, or were just terrible overall. But that doesn't change the fact that for a lot of these series, going in blind, seeing where it all end up, was a hell of an experience for many people such as myself. But in recent years, as more anime adaptations are popping up more frequently, that I wouldn't be surprised if the business strategy wasn't inspired by rabbits fucking. Good luck in that image after your head. Original anime, I honestly kind of think, gets benched for more popular series nowadays. Now, that isn't to say every original series is getting pushed aside, as there are a number of series that people have been keeping an eye on and discussing. But then that made me sort of beg the question, what about the other original anime? What about other shows from years ago that got some attention when they were out, but not too many people have actually been discussing it? And don't misunderstand, I'm including myself into that question as well. Some of my personal favorite series of anime have been original, but I also realize that I barely ever talk about them unless I actively think about bringing them up once online and never again. So I want to change that, and hopefully, maybe have this be the start of something that I'll eventually snowball into something enjoyable. In this video, I'm going to be bringing up 14 series that are, at the very least, worth recommending for people to take a look at. Now, this doesn't promise anything. It doesn't promise that every last one of these series I'm going to talk about are going to be masterpieces or underrated gems. It doesn't promise that the series I'm going to talk about doesn't have a bad or even an anticlimactic ending. This is just 14 original series that over the years I've been interested in for various reasons and just want to throw these out for the sake of discussing original anime more. You may have seen all of these, you may have seen a handful of these, or you may have seen none of these. Either way, my hopes in making this video at the very most is that it gets more people, even if it is just one other person, to discuss original anime series regardless of when it came out. A couple things I want to make clear though. These are not all going to be the really obvious series that everyone has at the very least heard about and at most talked about. At this point, I'm fairly certain most, if not all of you, are aware of Cowboy Bebop, or Samurai Champloo, or Kill la Kill, or Death Parade, or Panty and Stocking, or Fooly Cooly. But also, these shows I've picked aren't the most underrated either. Again, you've probably already seen or heard about some or all of these series. These are shows that, while may actually ring a bell for you, are shows that I've seen in the past but never really talked about, or have talked about and want to hear other people's thoughts on since that's... Actually kind of rare for me to get at times nowadays. And since these are specifically series I'm talking about, I won't be including films. Maybe if people want me to in the future, I will, but for right now, I'll just be sticking to anime series specifically. Lastly, I'm gonna try and stay away from shows that started this year. I want to pull up shows from previous years that I was interested in, but haven't talked about much since I saw them. And to put this out there, if you know an original anime series that you want to discuss about, whether it's good or bad, feel free to talk about it in the comments. Or hell, make your own video talking about it. This isn't me trying to make a video putting down others, this isn't me proving a point or some shit. This is just my attempt to get a ball rolling on a subject that I think should be talked about more. Now with that out of the way, let's get started. It's just going to be me giving a quick rundown and my thoughts on these series and moving on to the next one. This one scene alone was breathtaking for me to continue watching this series when it came out. Review Starlight is about high school girls in a drama club gearing up to perform their very own rendition of Starlight, the tragic tale of two goddesses drawn together by the glow of the heavens but destined to be pulled apart, never to meet again. One student is 16-year-old Karen Aijo, an easygoing girl who has dreamed of performing on stage since she was a child. 
Her love for theater is further invigorated when her childhood friend Hikari Kagura transfers to Seisho Academy. Through her old friend, Kaden stumbles upon a secret elevator leading to a massive theater underneath the school. Hosted by a talking giraffe, this arena serves as a battleground where her classmates participate in duels to determine who among them deserves the title of Top Star, earning them the right to play one of the lead roles in Starlight. Emboldened by the promise she made with Hikari to someday be stars together, Kaden enters these mysterious battles in the hopes of making their dream a reality. This show is beautiful in many ways, and many of the characters I do actually like. I will admit, it does have points that I can definitely be critical about with it, but overall, it's a decent experience. There's beautiful animation, beautiful designs, beautiful music, and of course, beautiful characters. It's an interesting concept of turning a play and acting into a battleground for the right to be the lead, which actually is pretty entertaining and investing to watch. The Girl in Twilight, oh my god, that is a really poor choice for an anime name. Yeah, I'm going full weeb on this. Akane Nasu Shoujo is about an urban legend using a radio player to produce frequencies in front of the Akayuki Sacred Tree at exactly 444, transporting people to a different dimension. When Asuka Tsuchimiya and her friends decide to perform this ritual as an activity of the Crystal Radio Research Club, they are shocked when the ritual works. The five travel to a parallel world, known as a Fragment, where they meet an unsettling familiar girl, Asuka's parallel world self, who tells them about the great danger that faces all of the parallel worlds, the Twilight, which strips them of the parallel worlds of all possibilities, led by the Twilight King. Akane Nasu Shoujo follows the five girls as they learn to accept their true selves, all the while searching for the Twilight King. However, the solution to the invasive Twilight might be closer than they think. This is Persona with Multiverse Theory, Walkmans, and Cute. Scratch that. Only cute girls. And I know that's not fair, but come on, high schoolers learn to accept their true selves, using devices to awaken powers, traveling to another world, changing some wardrobes. I'm not fucking blind, alright? Now, to be fair, I know Persona is not the first series to do shit like this, and not the only series. And in Akane Nasu Shoto's defense, it's actually alright. I mean, the characters' individual stories and internal struggles are actually pretty interesting to watch. Hell, I was kind of joking, but I wouldn't be opposed to actually having this plot be in my next Persona game. It's not that bad. I only saw it once, but honestly the fact that it stuck with me years later? That's such a kind of nice when your series is able to do that in a more positive light. The animation is alright, it does have noticeable CGI, especially in its fights, but I mean, you got cute girls kicking ass, learning to be their own person, and multiverse theory. I think it's worth taking a look at, at the very least. I'm gonna make this quick since you most likely have already heard about this series, and if you've seen my content since the beginning of this year, you already know my thoughts on it. And I know, this is a more recent series, and again, this series has gained quite the popularity. But, I'd rather it not end up being a forgotten series, you know? The Greg Pretender is about a con artist named Makoto Edamura pickpocketing and scamming others for a living. However, after swindling a seemingly clueless tourist, Makoto discovers that he was the one tricked, and to make matters worse, the police are now after him. While making his escape, he runs into the tourist once again, who turns out to be a fellow con man named Laurent Thierry, and ends up following him to Los Angeles. In an attempt to defend his self-proclaimed title as Japan's greatest swindler, Makoto challenges his rival to determine the better scammer. Accepting the competition, Laurent drops him off on a huge mansion and claims that their target will be the biggest mafia boss on the west coast. Jumping from city to city, the great pretender follows the endeavors of Makoto alongside the cunning Laurent and his colorful associates in the world of international high-stakes fraud. Soon Makoto realizes that he got more than what he bargained for as his self-declared skills are continually put to the test. I'll keep this brief, this is one of the most enjoyable series I've ever had the pleasure of being introduced to. It's got beautiful art and animation, wonderful voice acting, a quality soundtrack, and a story that constantly left me asking, Okay mate, where's this going? This series is fun and captivating in so many ways, and if you want a more detailed opinion on my thoughts about the show, please check out my video on The Great Pretender and check out the show for yourself if you haven't already. And now for a series that's not as fun, but worth a watch nonetheless.
Terror and Resonance is about the story of Nine and Twelve, the two boys behind the masked figures of Sphinx. They should not exist, yet stand strong in a world of deception and secrets while they make the city fall around them, all in the hopes of burying their own tragic truth. This series is depressing, but at the same time, I kind of enjoy it because of it. It's a complex story where if you take what you see at face value, you're not going to get much out of the show. You can just see this as characters as terrorists who cause chaos and destruction throughout Japan, or you can take a look behind the cover and read into it all. It rides a morally gray line throughout its run, and it's a show that'll probably leave you with mixed emotions up to the end. I can't tell you how many times I fell silent in investment watching this series, either by shock or by anxiety or by sorrow. It's a series that is really hard to really describe perfectly in words for me, really. All I can say is, if you get the chance, take a look. Again, another series that's hard for me to describe in words perfectly. Eden of the East is about Saki Moremi, a young woman currently in the United States of America on her graduation trip. But just when she is in front of the White House, Washington DC, she gets into trouble and only the unexpected intervention of one of her fellow countrymen saves her. However, this man who introduces himself as Akira Takizawa is a complete mystery. He appears to have lost his memory, is stark naked except for the gun he holds in one hand and the mobile phone he's holding in the other, a phone that's charged with 8.2 billion yen in digital cash. This is one of those series that you can't really get in one viewing. There's a lot of attention to detail in the animation and the story and the characters, all the way up to the ending. And there's also a fair amount of show don't tell, an aspect of entertainment I thoroughly enjoy. The acting honestly feels less like I'm watching an anime and a live action drama series. By that I mean, it's really good. I watched this primarily in English and everyone in this sounds less like they're playing a role and ring off a script and more of having a normal conversation in real life. Which considering this is actually just the opposite of that is quite a feat in and of itself. The music is really well composed and it comes with one of my favorite tracks out of the series, which is what you're hearing now, Reveal the World by Brenda Vaughn. Gives me chills every time I hear it, it's just so good. This story is definitely one of a kind, and one that left me both with mixed emotions, but at the same time, I couldn't help but smile after everything was said and done. The series was directed by Kenji Kamiyama, the same director for Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. I enjoyed the series so much, I actually own the physical copy. And I don't buy a physical copy of an anime unless it's something I intend to rewatch more than once whenever I want. Give it a look-see. It is a really good series I enjoyed to the end and could not recommend it enough. I'm actually not too surprised I rarely ever talk about this show. Dog Days takes place in the world of Flonyard, an alternate Earth inhabited by beings who resemble humans but also have the ears and tails of specific animals. In an effort to save Biscotti, Princess Milihor summons a champion from another world in order to defend her people. That champion is Sinke Izumi, a normal junior high student from Earth. Sinke is successful in his role as Biscotti's champion, but learns that a summoned champion cannot be returned to their home world. The scientists of Biscotti will endeavor to find a way for Sinke to return home, but until they figure something out, he must serve Princess Milihor by continuing to fight as Biscotti's hero. I had fun. I don't really know what else to say about the series, it's kind of one of the series that I really didn't take that seriously. I don't really have too much of a problem with what I watched, but I really only watched the first season and only once, but it was alright when I watched it. The art and animation are decent, the acting is good, the music is alright, the story is okay, it's really just okay for me. I had fun. If you're interested in demi-humans, isekais, and the usual fantasy tropes for the most part, you might like this. Or not. Who knows? I'm actually a little surprised I don't hear too many people talking about this nowadays.
fractal takes place on an island where a fractal system is beginning to collapse. One day, Klain finds an injured girl called Frayne under a cliff. She disappears, leaving a pendant. Klain sets out for a journey with the girl-shaped avatar Nessa to look for Frayne and discovers the secret of the fractal system. It's actually a pretty decent show. I was actually surprised this didn't have a manga to it since it sort of feels like this is something that would be adapted. I like the characters, I think the story is pretty interesting, the music goes alright, and the animation is actually pretty good. The director for this, Yutaka Yamamoto, has done work in the past for Lucky Star and Haruhi Suzumiya, among other works. It's again, actually a pretty decent show. There's a lot of beautiful animation, some really nice flying scenes and world shots, and a good amount of comedy and some interesting technology. Give it a look if you're interested. This just screams Kyoani, doesn't it? Tamago Market is about Tamako Kita Shira Ka. Tamago Market is about Tamako, a clumsy though adorable teenage girl that belongs to a family of mochi bakers who own a quaint shop called Tamaya. One day, Tamako stumbles upon a talking bird that presents itself as royalty from a distant land. Dera Mojimatsu, as he calls himself, states that he's seeking a bride for his country's prince. Intent on his mission, Dera follows Tamako home and develops an addiction to mochi, becoming painfully overweight and subsequently unable to fly back to his homeland. Thus, he takes up residence with Tamako's family and becomes the community's beloved mascot. Meanwhile, Tamako's friend, Mochi Zooji, continues to hide his true feelings for her. Their fathers are fierce mochi rivals, but will it be enough to drive a wedge between Tamako and Mochizo? And just what will happen to Dara's task of finding his prince's destined bride? Yeah, to describe the show in a word, KyoAni. Even from that premise alone, if you've never seen this show, you already know what type of show you're getting into. Meaning, this is either gonna be for you or not. Me personally, I love KyoAni's works. This is right up my alley. It's funny how the majority of their series are kinda all the same, yet at the same time, it also has plenty of charm, comedy, drama, and adorableness to keep me invested throughout the series. And I said majority. I'm aware that they know how to sucker punch my heartstrings where it hurts. It's a series that, if you want to kick back and relax with, I definitely think it's good. <laughs> Hanome system is a highly advanced development that allows people to enter one of the most intriguing places in existence, the human mind. Through the use of so-called cognition particles left behind at a crime scene by the perpetrator, detectives from the specialized police squad Kuda can manifest a criminal's unconscious mind as a bizarre stream of thoughts in a virtual world. Their task is to explore this psychological plane called an idwell to reveal the identity of the culprit. The first episode when I watched it kept me invested the whole time. From the first frame to the scene of our main character realizing the state he's in, to him attempting to work his head around a situation, to analyzing his surroundings to discover more and more about the world he's in, is something that captivated me. Right off the bat, I wanted to know more about where the show was going. It's a very interesting series with a really interesting concept. The idea of metal work around a murder mystery has been tackled before, but... I haven't really seen it like how this series plays it off. It's, well, interesting. I don't know what else to say other than that. I actually think I need to make a video on this series. Despite the kaleidoscopic magic ingrained in everyday life, Hitomi Tsukishiro's monochrome world is deprived of emotion and feeling. On a night as black and white as any other, amidst the fireworks spreading across the sky, 
Hitomi's grandmother, Kohaku, conjures a spell, for which she has been harnessing the moon's light for 60 years, to send Hitomi back in time to the year 2018 when Kohaku was in high school. Hitomi's mission seems unclear, but her grandmother assures that she will know when she gets there. Following a trip through time aboard a train driven by a strange yellow creature, Hitomi finds herself in stoic artist Yuito Aoi's room, and his drawings flood her world with color. What is Hitomi's purpose there, and why do Yuito's drawings return such breathtaking color to her drab world? This actually captures something out of my life that I have been dealing with for a long time. Apathy and inspiration. The use of black and white throughout the show and the color appearing with Hitomi to me is really a beautiful thing. In the first episode, this is one scene that I can't even describe with words. It is just incredibly beautiful to look at, and it captures how I took looking at others' art as a kid, which in time would inspire me to do what I do now. I don't know if this show is really for a lot of people, but I don't know. Maybe give it a shot. You might like it or not like it. Who knows? Some say save the best for last. But this isn't a top 10 list, so I can put this wherever the hell I feel like. Sota Mizushino is a high school student who aspires to be a creator by writing and illustrating his own light novel. One day, while watching anime for inspiration, he is briefly transported into a fierce fight scene. When he returns to the real world, he realizes something is amiss. The anime's headstrong heroine, Celestia Euptidia, has somehow returned with him. Before long, other fictional characters appear in the world, carrying the hopes and scars of their home. A princely knight, a magical girl, a ruthless brawler, and many others now crowd the streets of Japan. However, the most mysterious one is a woman in full military regalia, dubbed Gunpuku no Himigi, or in English, the military uniform princess, who knows far more than she should about the creator's world. Despite this, no one knows her true name or the world she's from. Meanwhile, Sota and Celestia work together with Meteora Osterreich, a calm and composed librarian NPC to uncover the meaning behind these unnatural events. With powerful forces at play, the once clear line between reality and imagination continues to blur, leading to a fateful meeting between the creators and those they created. If you were to ask me what's my favorite anime as a kid, I'd give you a different answer with each passing month. It's been four years since this released, and I can say for certain, that Recreators is my favorite anime. I won't go into too much detail as I plan to actually do a whole video on the series in the near future, so I'll make this quick. Recreators has some of the best animation I've seen, some of the best characters and character designs I've seen, some of the best writing I've seen, and some of the best music and voice acting I've heard in an anime. The conversations that happen throughout this show keep me invested to the end, and the fights even more so. The acting is very well done, and every actor and actress should feel proud for their work on this. I cannot recommend this show enough to anyone interested in interesting stories and good character development. And again, I'll definitely be making a full video going into detail about this wonderful show that at this point, I consider to be a timeless classic. The story takes place in Sugomori, a city built upon the reclaimed land that once prospered as a futuristic city. One high school boy living there, Agata Katsushira, is somehow unable to feel any pain. One day just before the start of summer break, Katsushira is called by a mysterious girl named Sonozaki Noriko and chosen to become one of a group of people who share one another's pain, a Kizniver. Several of his classmates have also been chosen as part of this group, but they're all people from different circles who wouldn't normally associate with one another. This show as a whole honestly captures what I both love and criticize about Trigger's work. Good concept, good characters, but somewhere down the line it sorta of falls flat. But that said, that doesn't negate the fact that this show is actually very interesting. People come from all walks of life, but the one thing we can empathize with is the experience of pain. And this show does a good job of illustrating those experiences in various ways. And from here, I kinda have to cut it short before I spoil too much. It's got good animation, the acting is well done, the characters are memorable, although some of them can be one-noted characters at times, or just a bit confusing. And the story isn't exactly the best, but the show is... good. Give it a look-see sometime. In 
the distant future, a majority of humans have left the Earth and the Galactic Alliance of Humanity is founded to guide the exploration and ensure the prosperity of mankind. However, a significant threat arises in the form of strange creatures called Hedeals, resulting in an interstellar war to prevent humanity's extinction. Armed with Chamber and Autonomous Robot, 16-year-old Lieutenant Leto of the Galactic Alliance joins the battle against the monsters. In an unfortunate turn of events, Leto loses control during the battle and is cast out of the far reaches of space, crash landing on a waterlogged Earth. On the blue planet, Gargantia, a large fleet of scavenger ships, comes across Chamber and retreats it from the ocean, thinking they may have salvaged something of value. Mistaking their actions for hostility, Leto sneaks on board and takes a young messenger girl named Amy hostage, only to realize that the residents of Gargantia are not as dangerous as he had believed. Faced with uncertainty and unable to communicate with his comrades in space, Leto attempts to get his bearings and accumulate to a new lifestyle. But his peaceful days are about to be short-lived, as there is more to this ocean-covered planet than meets the eye. This is indeed a worthwhile watch, and interestingly enough, the one thing a number of original anime series kinda has working against it is their lack of accessibility for watching online, or even buying a physical copy. This show is available to watch on several different platforms, except Netflix now. See, this is why I'm more in favor of buying physical copies to media I'm really invested in. The role building is definitely some of the best I've seen out of an original anime. The character interactions are also really good. The animation is also really good, especially in the CGI and some other aspects. The music is pretty good as well, and the story is really interesting. Most of the background is mainly water most of the time, but I actually do like how it incorporates that a number of times throughout the story and world building. I also enjoy seeing characters adapt to other cultures' way of living, and this does a decent job of doing that showing both differences and similarities. Which is putting it pretty fucking lightly, this show takes a few hard turns at times, but I mean that in a good way. It's definitely a series worth taking a look at, honestly. Last but not least, another show I enjoyed up to the end. Hana is a girl raised by strict foster parents who has long given up her dreams of freedom. Michiko is a sexy criminal who escapes from a supposedly inescapable prison. When she suddenly enters Hana's life, these two very different women set off on a journey across a lawless land in search of a missing man from both their pasts. This show I think ends up on the more under the radar category honestly. It was animated by Studio Manglobe, a studio that was known for making quality series, but not a lot of them turning out much reception or even much profit. There are some exceptions of course, but considering that they actually filed for bankruptcy two days after their final series Gangsta released its 12th episode, I think it's safe to say that shows like Michiko and Hachin, while not bad honestly, did not do that well overall in the long run. Especially since... I don't actually remember how I even got word of the series in the first place. I don't know exactly how other people are going to easily get word of it in the years to come. Unless this video takes off, which, realistically, fat chance of that happening. <laughs> uh. but, but, but if you can manage to watch it, check it out. Beautiful animation, good music, some pretty good character moments, and a pretty simple yet decent story. It's got a lot going for it, and it's a series that I think is alright. There's a lot of characters throughout it, but many of them are pretty interesting, or at the very least, entertaining. The acting is really good as well. It's one of those series that is more about the journey than the destination, and it's a type of story I enjoy fine. 